If you have a Bible, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to come to the, the, the end of this first section of the letter, which is 1 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. So we're going to look at verses 4 down through verse 10. I'll be gone next Sunday, but Mark Wells, who leads our worship team, will be preaching verses 11 down through 17 next week. I think there's three things to say. There's, well, there's a whole lot more to say, but I've put together three things from this text that I, I think will be an encouraging word to us. The first is this, that the church, that's, that's you and me who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we enjoy an incredible status because of Jesus. You'll remember these Christians are scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And as we make our way through the letter, specifically beginning in next week and following, we're going to see that these Christians are going through a hard time. Probably their suffering for the sake of Christ had not gone all the way to bloodshed yet, but they were being mocked and they were being ignored and they were being oppressed and they were being maligned and they were being marginalized because of their faithfulness to Jesus. And I think one of the things that Peter wanted to do is to remind them how special they are, how special we are in the mind of God. He's going to say a few things about it. We're going to look at verses 4 and 5, and then I'm going to skip down to verses 9 through 10. But here we go. Verse 4. And coming to him, that's, that's coming to Jesus, as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. In other words, and we'll see it in a second, Christ is the cornerstone of a temple that God is building of his people. And each one of us who believe in Christ, who come to Christ, trust in him, follow him, look to him, we are stones that are being lined up with that cornerstone which is Christ and building the temple of God. We come to him as to a living stone. Stones are usually thought as inert and lifeless, but not Jesus, right? Peter's already used this word a couple of times that our hope in chapter one is a living hope because it's connected to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Later on in chapter 1, this word of the gospel, it is a living and enduring word of God. So a living hope, a living word, and now Christ is the living stone. Raised from the dead, victorious and alive, which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God. The imagery is of the builders of this temple coming along and they're looking for just the right stone to build the temple off of, the cornerstone, that most special and significant of stones from which all the others will be laid. And they took a look at this stone and said, we don't want it. You ever go to the river and skip rocks? You're looking for just the right stone, right? You pick one up, nope. You pick one up, nope, nope. And you finally find a good one. And you give it your best shot. Well, they picked up the stone of Christ. These leaders in Israel. And said, we don't want him. He was rejected by men. But choice and precious in the sight of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the promises, of all of the prophecies, 
of all of the anticipation and expectation of the old covenant. It came due in him, fulfilled in him. And while the leadership of Israel said no, and the Gentile leaders crucified him, this was the one in whom all of the promises and all of the prophecies were fulfilled. This was the son of God. He was choice and precious in the sight of God. Probably Peter has in mind for these suffering readers that you too, as a follower of Jesus, might feel like you're being rejected by men. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's a brother or sister. Maybe it's friends at school. Maybe it's a teammate. Maybe it's people at work. You've come to the living stone. You've come to Christ. And you are being rejected for it. But Peter probably wants us to know that just as Jesus was rejected by men, but as choice and precious in the sight of God, so are you. Choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones, we who are connected to this one who has been raised and is alive forevermore, Peter says we too connected to him are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. God dwelt under the old covenant in that tabernacle, you'll remember. Israel given instructions in the latter part of the book of Exodus to build a tabernacle and God would dwell among his people. And they built it and in Exodus chapter 40, the glory of the Lord came to dwell among the people of Israel. And the tabernacle went along and it was if you will, fulfilled in the temple that Solomon built there in Jerusalem, glorious, beautiful, magnificent. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, the glory of God comes to dwell among his people. Well, under the new covenant, God does not dwell in a tabernacle or in a temple he dwells with his people who are this spiritual house, this temple. So one thing Peter wants you and me to know is that we are the dwelling place of God. One of the incredible, magnificent, amazing truths of the new covenant is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God who comes to dwell among his people. You and I are the dwelling place of God. We're more than that, though. We serve as priests offering up sacrifices to our great God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. So Peter moves the metaphor, if you will. At first, we're the temple. Now we're the priests who serve within this temple. Of course, under the old covenant, within Israel, the privilege of being a priest was reserved only for the Levites. Only a select few could enter into the temple and only the high priest could enter into the holy of holies, into the presence of God. Only a select few, those priests, had the privilege of offering the sacrifices of the people before God. Only a select few had that kind of privilege. But the New Testament now teaches us that all of us are priests to God, the priesthood of believers. We all can approach God. We don't have to go through any person other than the person of Jesus Christ. We can all approach him. We can all talk to God. We can confess our sins to him. And just as those priests under the old covenant had that that particular responsibility to be the ones who would teach the people of God the word of God, that is a privilege and a responsibility that now all of us have. And while only a few, the select few, could offer up sacrifices, Peter says, 
that we are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The rest of the New Testament gives us maybe some clues as to what those spiritual sacrifices might be. I'm just going to read some of them to you. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you might have that one memorized. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so we offer up ourselves to God as a spiritual sacrifice to him. Or in Romans 15, Paul describes his evangelistic ministry this way. I've written very boldly to you on some points, writing to the Romans, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So so Paul says, I'm a priest, and I have this glorious opportunity to share the word of God, the gospel of God, with the Gentiles. And as some of them come to faith in Jesus, I offer that up as a sacrifice to the Lord. Or another one here in Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes Philippians, on the whole, it's really a thank you letter to the Philippians for their wonderful generosity. And he says, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So our generous giving in love to others and for the sake of the gospel, just like those if you will, the physical offerings under the old covenant when they were offered up on the altar and the fire and the smoke went up and the Bible says that it was a soothing aroma. It's it's the picture as if God was and it bringing a smile to his face. Paul says that their giving, their generosity was a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. A couple more from the book of Hebrews In chapter 13, the author says this. So let us go out to Jesus outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Through Jesus then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So we get a clue. Grudem says this, These various examples encourage us to think that anything we do in service to God can be thought of as a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God, a continual sweet aroma that ascends to his throne and brings him delight. So we are the the dwelling place of God. And we, all of us who believe, are priests. Not just a select few of us, but all of us can approach God and serve God and be a blessing to others with his word. And number three, under this first point, we are now God's people to fulfill his purposes. And that's where I want to jump down for just a bit, down to verse nine. Again, these suffering Christians. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. 
Wow. These are Gentile believers scattered all over. And yet Paul, or I'm sorry, Peter, says, oh no. He grabs verse after verse, idea after idea from the Old Testament of of realities that were true of Israel and applies them to you and me. Gentiles from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. We are a chosen race. While Israel was the race that God had chosen to work through in the Old Testament, Christians now form this race that God is using to accomplish his purposes. Membership in this new chosen race is not by physical descent from Abraham, but by coming to Christ. This is a spiritual race. And again, it's made up of multitudes of ethnicities from all over the world. This chosen race is not defined by color. It's not defined by culture, but as one said, by creed, what we believe. Whenever you and I believe in Jesus for the salvation of our souls, we become part of this chosen race. We belong to God. And we're a royal priesthood from Exodus chapter 19. Applied to Israel, now applied to all of us. We already saw it earlier that we are a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And here, Peter says, we are a royal priesthood. We belong to the king. In the ancient world, it wasn't uncommon for a king to have his own group of priests. And in this kingdom of God, we are all priests underneath our heavenly king. We have direct access to him without any need of any, if you will, earthly mediator. We are, Peter says, a holy nation. Again, in Exodus 19, this was applied to the nation of Israel, but Peter says, no, now it's part of the church. Just as Israel had been set apart to be the people of God, now all who believe in Christ Jesus are holy. They have been set apart to be his. Again, this nation is not defined by ethnic identity, not by geographical boundaries, but by our allegiance to Jesus. And Peter says we are a people for God's own possession. We belong to him. You'll remember that from chapter one, verses 17 and following, that we were redeemed, verse 18, not with perishable things like silver or gold from our feudal way of life inherited from our forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless. We belonged to sin and to Satan, and we were destined for death, eternal death. But God, through his son and his shed blood upon the cross, bought us back to be his. We belong to him. We are his possession. We are significant and we are precious in his sight. Praise God for that. But secondly, not only do we have these incredible, this incredible status before God, but I think maybe Peter wants us to know that any opponents we might have, opponents that may malign us or marginalize us or picket us or 
whatever it might be, because of our faithfulness to Jesus, that 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 is in God's hands. So in verse 6, he's going to support the preciousness of Christ that he talked about earlier, that though he was rejected by men, he's choice and precious in the sight of God and also that those of us who believe in him experience incredible honor. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So Christ is that cornerstone, precious in God's sight. And when we believe in him, We are not disappointed. And in verse 7, this precious value then, some uh, translations, this, this honor that becomes ours is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. There's incredible honor, incredible value that comes to those who believe. There is sad dishonor and embarrassment and stumbling that come ultimately to those who disbelieve. Peter quotes from Psalm 118, the victorious king who was initially doubted and rejected. God vindicated him. He is the choice cornerstone. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. If you disbelieve in Christ, he doesn't go away. The stone doesn't go away. It's it's there. And the imagery that Peter has in mind, quoting from David, is that it's there and you trip over it. You stumble over it. And it's because, Peter says, of their unbelief. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word. That word is the gospel word that was preached to us at the end of chapter 1. And this is the word that was preached to you. The good news of the gospel that he is indeed, though rejected by men, he is choice. He is God's man who lived and died and rose for us. That through him, we might be forgiven and reconciled to God and given the living hope of eternal life. That's the word. And they rejected it. They were offended by it. And they stumble over it. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this they were also appointed. The fact that some would reject the son of God, not all would believe was something that was predicted throughout the Old Testament and in the inscrutable plan of God, it is something that he has planned. Grudem says, Peter's purpose in making this comment is to comfort his readers. Having demonstrated that the hostile unbelief which confronted the believers on every side was predicted in the Old Testament, he now says, that they were not only predicted, but also planned by God and therefore within the scope of his sovereign and wise plan for the world. This is the inscrutable mind of God. And in his sovereign plans, he, out of the mass of humanity that are rebels against him, he has chosen some who will be his and he has passed over others. And how we put those two together 
Charles Spurgeon is famous. He was asked, how do you reconcile those two? And he said, you do not reconcile friends. The Bible teaches the awesome sovereignty of God. It teaches the responsibility of man. And he said, how they come together, I do not always know, but I will trust and I will proclaim them both. So, we have a wonderful, awesome status before God, and we know and understand that any opponents that we might have in the gospel are according to God's plans. And then finally and quickly, the church's purpose is to proclaim God's excellencies. Verse 9, you are chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. That is a great, powerful line Proclaim the excellencies of him, the moral excellencies of God, the intrinsic beauty of God and his incredible acts in the world to bring about the salvation of his people through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is no doubt excellent and does excellent And he called us out of darkness, out of spiritual darkness and into his marvelous light. We didn't see. And now by his grace, we see his glory and his goodness and his love and his kindness and his truth. We once were not a people. Here's here's Peter again. Taking a text that was applied to Old Testament Israel and saying it's true of us. You remember the book of Hosea? This is where he is quoting from. Hosea was commanded by God to to take a wife, a a wife of adultery. And there's all kinds of, what exactly does that mean? I think what it meant was that he was to take a wife named Gomer, who would then prove herself to be unfaithful to him. Just like God had taken Israel and Israel proved to be unfaithful to him. And they have some children. And one of those children is is named, um, oh, I forget, but it means God sows or God scatters. And it was meant to picture what was coming upon the northern kingdom of Israel because of their rebellion against God, because of their unfaithfulness to their heavenly husband. He was going to scatter them to the Assyrians. And then he was to have another, or they had another child, and he was to name that child unpitied because God was not going to show pity to them. Because of their rebellion, they were going to be taken away into exile. And they had a third kid, and he named that kid not my people. They were his people. And yet, because of their unfaithfulness, name them not my people. But then in the very next verse, God begins through the prophet Hosea to talk about when he's going to bring his people back to him. Well, those verses get applied to you and me. We once were not a people, but now we are the people of God. We had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. That's awesome. And let's make sure we see it again in verse 9. So that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We talk all the time around here about living on mission in 
my circle, your circle, where you live, where you work, where you study, where you play. But God has you in particular places in your life and people who are far from God in your life. And one of the purposes that he has for you and for me and us together as the people of God is that we would proclaim the excellencies of him. That every man, woman, and child in our city would have the repeated opportunity to see, hear, and respond to the gospel. May God give you and me grace to own that again, to feel and to love the lost and to love the glory and the excellency of him who incredibly brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. At our discipleship group this last Friday morning, we were talking about the book of Acts and, and being a witness for Christ. And when Peter and John and the others said, we cannot stop proclaiming what we have seen and heard. What we've experienced in Jesus, you can tell us to stop all you want. You can throw us in prison. You can even kill us if you'd like, but we're not going to stop giving witness to who Jesus Christ is and what we have experienced. May God help you and me to be much the same. Let's pray and we'll sing one more time. Father in heaven, for any of my brothers and sisters here, who may be feeling a little bit of heat or maybe a lot of heat, for their faithfulness to Jesus. Remind them that they are special to you. Maybe they feel all alone. Maybe they feel marginalized. Maybe they, they're made to feel stupid because of what they believe. Backward. not progressing. Would you remind them again that they are yours? They are the very dwelling place of God. They are priests to our God. They are a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people of God's own possession. What status, what privilege, what amazing truth. Help us all to remember it, that we belong to you. And Lord, help us more faithfully proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. And if there's any here today who've never put their trust in Jesus. Maybe they walked in in that kind of spiritual darkness. But maybe through the singing of those gospel songs and through the Lord's Supper, the body of Christ given for us, the blood of Christ shed for us, through the preaching of your word, maybe God, you would bring them now out of the darkness and into the marvelous light of Christ. That they would turn from themselves and turn to Jesus. That he might be their Lord and their Savior forevermore. And we'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen.